In today's video, we're going over my favorite intermediate exercises for shoulder pain in the gym. All right, first and foremost, if you have a patient who has a highly irritated shoulder, you probably have to start with the basics for that person. So things like sideline extra rotation, scaption, so on and so forth. I made a video for that. I'll leave a link in the description. You can check that out later. However, when someone's trying to get back to higher level stuff in the gym, so I'm talking about things like bench press, overhead press, Olympic lifts, we have to give folks harder exercises than things like scaption, extra rotation. We have to bridge that gap from easy to intermediate to advanced. So in today's video, we're gonna go over my favorite exercise to use after you get through those initial beginner phases. All right, so the first step when you're starting to progress from beginner stage of rehab to more intermediate stages of rehab is we can just increase the load slightly. We can increase the speed slightly. So if you're doing beginner exercises like sideline extra rotation and scaption, these are still phenomenal exercises. It's just that we have to progress the challenge of these. And a very easy way to do this, and this goes for every exercise that you can use during your rehab plan, is by increasing the loads and increasing the speeds. So essentially, we have Mike right here. Let's go ahead and perform a few sideline external rotations. And then as you come up, a little bit more speed and then control it on the way down, right? And he's using an eight. So generally speaking, maybe your shoulder pain patient starts with like a two or a three because they're so painful. And as they start to feel a bit better, we just ratchet up this weight a little bit, all right? Super simple, but very important. So after you start increasing the loads and the speeds of your basic movements, step two is advancing the challenge of movements. And generally speaking, we want these exercises to start to simulate what the athlete wants to get back to. For most of the folks I work with, it's gonna be strength training within the gym. So our rotator cuff exercises and our scapular stability exercises are trying to look a little bit more close to, let's say, a clean and jerk and a snatch or a bench press. And we actually start to incorporate more pressing and rowing exercises because these are A, great rehab tools, but it's also exactly what the athlete wants to get back to. So beginner stage, basic easy exercises. Intermediate, we start to advance this. We start to get more specific to the athlete's goals. Next, we start thinking about increasing the challenge of our rotator cuff as well as scapular stability exercises. One easy way to advance these movements and also progress towards, let's say, overhead lifts is start doing your movements from here up to here, right? Because now we're starting to get a little bit more overhead. So we have a cable. I'm gonna have Mike show off some 90-90 external rotation first. So grabbing, yep, and now the elbow is at shoulder level and from here he's externally rotating into my hand. Yep, let's do two or three. Perfect, right? So an advancement of sideline external rotation as well as banded external rotation. Next, we'll just flip and have you face me. We do the same thing for internal rotation. So elbow, yep, at the shoulder level, coming right down. Very good, take a breather. For some folks, being into end range horizontal abduction doesn't feel very good. So doing internal rotation, external rotation here just hurts. What we can do is we can take the elbow in the front, I call it the genie internal rotation, external rotation, and perform the same movement here. Oftentimes that's gonna be a little bit better tolerated. So from here, we'll have Mike go ahead and grab onto the cable, right? Very good. Dream, it's, if you remember, I dream of genie. I'm definitely dating myself. I don't think anyone knows who this is anymore, but you're in a genie position when you're doing this. Let's have you flip and we'll try the external rotation variant. So if that regular 90-90 external rotation is aggravating your patient's shoulders too much, we can go ahead and use a genie position and come across right here. Usually that's tolerated pretty dang well. Generally speaking, I like to start my scap stability exercises with a prone extension or prone A. And we can certainly do that with a cable or a band. So I'm gonna have Mike do a few repetitions, pulling straight back to his side, right? Very good. That looks phenomenal to me. As we start to advance, we can work into our traditional T's and Y's. Do you mind showing me a T here? These are often a little bit aggravating in the early stages of rehab, but once people get through a few weeks of some basic stuff, usually this is tolerated pretty well. We can also incorporate a Y, which is the same thing coming up a little bit higher. And this is probably the most challenging of the three movements. So I'd probably start with the A's, progress the T's, and then add in Y's eventually. To go along with this video, I have a free cheat sheet for you. It is an evidence-based cheat sheet for rotator cuff related pain. I'll give you all the knowledge to go from a beginner to a master in understanding rotator cuff related pathology. We go over the prevalence of these conditions, as well as the anatomy. We talk about the difference between tendonitis and tendinosis. 
We chat about risk factors, increase your likelihood of getting rotator cuff tendinopathy and tears. We talk about the clinical presentation of this disorder and also which tendons are most commonly involved. We talk about the different stages of pathology and whether or not the rotator cuff tear heals over the course of time. Next, I give you the bullet points about rehabilitation expectations. We round out the PDF with some surgical guidelines which your patients should go on to get surgery for rotator cuff tears. So I'm going to leave a link in the description in the show notes. Again, this is 100% free. Go ahead and download this right now. We can also start to get a little bit more fancy with our scap stability exercise as the shoulder starts to feel better and better. I like this variation because it kind of mimics similar force that you'll see in an Olympic lift, as well as pressing overhead. So in the pull of the snatch, as well as the turnover. So go ahead and show me this movement. This is going to be external rotation to an overhead press. So you can see Mike pulls his elbow level with the shoulder, externally rotates and presses fully overhead. Again, a fun advancement you can try with your athletes. Now we can certainly perform our T's and our Y's in either a bent over position, performing this way, or we can also have the chest on an incline bench and perform them there. One way I like to spice up these movements is by adding some stance side stability. So basically we're gonna have Mike right over here put his hand on the corner of the bench here, go into a plank, hold that for one second. So he's actively pushing away from the bench right here. So we're getting a lot of stability in the opposite side shoulder. And from here, he can perform his regular letters we just talked about, like go ahead and perform a T. Yep, there's the A, there's the T, and perform Ys as well. Go ahead and do an external rotation overhead press as well. Good, pressing right overhead. So we can do all the same exercises, get a lot of work to this side shoulder, but the stand side is getting a lot of work as well, okay? If this movement is a little bit too tough, we can get into that same position, but instead of being in a full plank, we just bend the knees, we go into a bear stance. You mind showing me that real quick, Mike? You want this guy? Sorry. Yeah. So you can see Mike's bent with his knees. He can also take a little more weight and just put it into his feet and a little less into his hand, right? So if it's too much stress for the stand side arm, we just bend the knees, take the weight a little bit more into the feet, all right? So if you have an absolute beast of an athlete, we can start going from a bench all the way down to the floor and make this harder and harder. So go ahead, Mike, and let's have you put your right hand on this uh, set of mats here. We'll go into a plank, keep that body nice and straight, and go ahead and perform a couple T's and Y's. So what happens is that the left side arm here is actually not doing as much work as the right side arm, which is planking, okay? And if you're really trying to get a lot of work for the stand side arm, this is a great movement. Another way to spruce up your sideline external rotation and your T is to add some stand side stability via a side plank. Let's go ahead and go into side plank. We'll start on your knees. And from here, Mike just keeps his elbow directly on his side, squeezes down and performs his external rotation. Okay, very good. So easy way to increase some of the challenge on the underside arm, stand side arm. The other thing we can try is we perform a T. So go ahead and reach your arm straight up to the uh, ceiling. Yep, you're coming all the way back down, tap the floor and right back up again. So very easy way to increase the challenge here with these movements. If this is too easy and you wanna get more core involved, let's go ahead and straighten out these legs and come right up. Just keep in mind with these variations, we're losing some of the stress on the rotator cuff and we're putting it more on the core. So sometimes we're actually doing the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish with these movements. Just keep that in mind. Next, let's talk a little bit about incorporating pressing and rowing. So usually in the beginning stages of physical therapy for folks with shoulder pain, I incorporate a lot of rowing. Reason being is that it's usually tolerated really well. On the flip side, pressing is normally not tolerated very well in most athletes early on, right? I would say that if your athlete has some shoulder pain, you should attempt to include some sort of pressing in the program. But if someone has a really irritated shoulder, sometimes we have to knock it out for a couple weeks, let the shoulder kind of calm down a little bit. And as we start to get some more tolerance in the shoulder, we bring it back, okay? Now, why do we include presses and rows? So for one, these are phenomenal rehab exercises. So if folks have shoulder pain, something like a press, something like a row is great for those folks. The other piece is it's very specific to the athletes that I work with. So most folks I work with, they wanna get back to bench press, they wanna get back to heavy rows, pull-ups, so on and so forth. Now, I wanna explain a little bit about how the rotator cuff works during pressing and pulling. So Watana Prokhorn call, at all in several studies have shown that the rotator cuff has a direction specific nature. Now, what do I mean by that? So I have my shoulder to help describe this. And what they did was a couple cool studies. So in one, they were looking at people performing a chest press on a machine. And they're also looking at people performing resisted flexion. So essentially they had folks on their belly, dumbbell in the hand, performing kind of like a Y maneuver, all right? So when they press, this way and perform resisted flexion. So think about an overhead press, very similar. The top 
and the back of the rotator cuff was very active. So supraspinatus as well as infraspinatus was working a lot during those movements. On the flip side, the subscapularis was actually very quiet. Now, in the same studies, they were looking at rowing, so resisted pulling, as well as resisted extension and prone, so here and coming straight back. And what they found is that the top and the back of the rotator cuff, so the supraspinatus and infraspinatus was actually quite quiet, but the subscapularis was actually very active, all right? So if you're trying to target the top and the back of the rotator cuff, pressing does that. If you're trying to target the subscapularis, the more the rowing does that. Now, why might this be? So the authors theorize that when you press, the muscles in the front of the shoulder are very active. Do a few air presses for me, Mike. So when we press, we know that the anterior delt, very active, pec major, very active. Those muscles are going to attach in front of the shoulder and they're going to attach on your humerus. And when you use these muscles and fire them, it's going to pull the ball forward in the socket. So essentially, when Mike presses, those muscles pull the ball boop, forward in the socket, right? Now, what is the primary restraint to this, Mike? Mike didn't know I was gonna put him on the spot. <laughs> so A, you have a capsule on the front of the shoulder, but on the back side, you're gonna have the back of the rotator cuff. So what happens is that as the ball is being pulled forward in the socket, the back of the rotator cuff has to say, whoa, whoa, we're going too far, let's pull you back, right? So when you press something really heavy, the infraspinatus has to fire with equal force to make sure the ball doesn't fly off the socket, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so the flip thing, the flip side, when you pull something, let's go ahead and just flip and pull a few rows in the air for me. So if I do a rowing exercise or some sort of prone extension, the musculature in the back of the shoulder is a little bit more active. So think about the posterior delt, think about the lats. There's a few different muscles that cross over the joint that are gonna tug the ball posteriorly in the socket, right? So essentially, and you can kind of spin for me here, so if I am performing a row, the opposite is going to happen. So when I press, the ball's gonna to wanna to go forward. When I row, the ball wants to go backwards. So what's that primary restraint in the front? It's a subscapularis. The subscapularis has to fire with equal opposing force to make sure the ball doesn't fly off the socket posteriorly, right? And what's kind of cool about pressing and rowing exercises is you're probably working towards the true function of the rotator cuff. It's just kind of keep that ball centered in the socket. So a press and a row maybe is not an isolation exercise for the cuff, but it's actually pretty dang good to work it functionally. So when we start to introduce pressing, generally speaking, we have to keep the loads lighter, and we also wanna keep the speeds moderate or slow. Over the course of time, as we start to progress and the shoulder feels better, we increase the loads, we increase the speeds, okay? So pretty simple concept, but very, very effective. One of the first pressing variations I like to incorporate for my athletes is a bottoms up press. Now this is for a couple reasons. So for one, when you perform a bottoms up press, usually you're more limited by your grip as opposed to the shoulder muscles. So performing the movement is actually really tough on the grip. The other thing is that this is very unstable. So we're gonna lose some of that ability to load just because we have a very unstable implement. Okay, let me show you what I'm talking about. So if you lay on your back here, Mike, I like to start with a floor press just because it's a partial range of motion. Generally, that's gonna be a little bit better tolerated. So go ahead and press right up to the ceiling there and then right back down again. So if we start using heavier and heavier kettlebells, what you'll notice is that it starts to get wobbly with the athlete. Oftentimes it starts to flip. So I have to grip very aggressively in order to perform this movement. And then we can't use that much load, which is, tends to be a little bit nicer on the shoulder. I think the other piece is that the kettlebell is inherently unstable, which is pretty nice from a rehab perspective, especially for those patients you're dealing with with instability issues, right? So once your athlete is tolerating a partial range of motion, I usually do the same exact thing and just pop up on the bench. So go ahead and we'll have you lay back and perform a bottoms up bench press. Yep, let's use the uh, left arm just so folks can see. And the big change from the floor to a bench is that now the elbow is free to go a little bit deeper. Oftentimes that end range of motion for painful shoulders is not tolerated well, but once we build some tolerance with the floor press, we can start to move our way towards doing a regular full range of motion bench press. Let's have you sit up for one second, Mike. As that starts to feel good, if your athlete is trying to get back to overhead pressing, we just slowly increase the incline. So let's do the same exact thing right here. Yep, and perform a few presses. Very good. And if your athlete is tolerating this really well, the last key is just to get them more upright and overhead, and let's just try a seated overhead press. Nice. Very simple, easy progression for your athletes. Go ahead and take a breather. So, I usually start incorporating a dumbbell. 
once your athlete is starting to tolerate some bottoms up pressing and they can tolerate a little bit more load, and we can use the same exact progression that we just used with a dumbbell. The thing about a dumbbell is it's going to be a little bit more stable. It's not upside down. It's not moving all around like a floppy fish, right? And because of that, we can increase the loads. And most folks are trying to get back to heavier loading. So the kettlebell bottoms up is a good introduction, but I would say as soon as you're able to, you should start using dumbbells to start loading your athletes. One nice cue I like to use for my patients when they're doing bottoms up press, let's go ahead and have you hold this here, is to put something on top of the kettlebell to make sure they stay nice and stable. Let's try a few repetitions here just like that. Looking great here, Mike. What I like to do is put my phone on top of here and then put this onto the fitness pain free channel and then click on all of the buttons and start watching videos. And just let that algorithm build, right? Just let it play over and over again. So I'm trying to blow up and become super famous. Another nice entry point for pressing for your athletes is what's called a landmine press, right? There's a few reasons why this might be helpful for folks and their shoulder pain, but I can't tell you exactly why this is. My guess is our A, when we press, it's a little bit more overhead. So if most folks are used to pressing horizontally, they overuse that pattern, it starts to get a bit irritated. If they move to more of an incline press, like what you'll see in a landmine, it feels a little bit better. The other piece is when you're doing a landmine press, you can use a little bit of your trunk. You can also reach and use your shoulder blade to assist the motion. The last piece is when you perform a landmine press, you actually turn a little bit. So if I'm doing a dumbbell press, I'm working more straight plane flexion. If I turn a little bit and press this way, I'm more in the scapular plane. And maybe for those reasons, it feels a little bit better. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. We're gonna have Mike go ahead and pick up this landmine. Very good. Let's go ahead and do the left side arm just so folks can see what's going on. All right, and let's go square stance. So just kind of face that barbell. We'll get the feet in, there you go. And when you press, go ahead and give me a little bit of turn at the end. Very good. So a few things. You can see that he's trying to actively reach. The shoulder blade is actually assisting the movement. The other piece is that he's turning a little bit. So he's getting his trunk involved. So the core is working a little bit over time, right? And go ahead one more time. And you see because he turns, he's pressing more in the scapular plane. And for all those reasons, it might be a little bit nicer on the shoulder than a typical bench press would be, all right? So another good thing to try for your athletes as they're progressing back to pressing. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about rowing. So rowing in general follows the same principles as with pressing. So we start with lighter loads, and we progress towards heavier loads. We start a little slower, we progress a little faster over the course of time. What I will say is that progressing back to rowing, way easier than progressing back to pressing. So usually this happens very quickly. It's not something you have to put a lot of thought into. But most folks that have pain in the gym with pulling, it's usually not with rows where your hand is below level of the shoulder. It's more with things where you're pulling from overhead. Think about a pull up, way to pull up. Those movements tend to be a little more provocative, right? So in the early stages of rehab, we're incorporating a whole bunch of row exercises. So things like single arm dumbbell rows, chest supported rows, TRX rows, all those are fair game. As we progress towards the intermediate stages and we wanna to start to advance things more, we can start doing some more pull down variations. One of my favorite is just a seated pull down. And let's have it sit on the floor here. Go ahead and grab onto this handle, right? And then from here, perform a few repetitions for me. And you can see we're not fully overhead here. We're still on a little bit of an angle, so we're not fully overhead and the position doesn't feel great. And over the course of time, as Mike's shoulder gets better and better, he can actually start to lean forward a little bit. So he is getting a more, yep, fully overhead position. And we can also very easily vary the load. Now in the pull up, harder to vary the load. Pull down, very easy. So I would think about incorporating single arm pull downs, double arm pull downs, and then start to progress back to pull ups as the shoulder builds tolerance. All right, let's talk a little bit about sets, reps, programming, so on and so forth, because I just gave you a whole lot of exercises. So generally speaking, I'm following these guidelines from what most of the literature shows, right? So if you look at most physical therapy, randomized control trials, they usually have two to three days per week where a patient goes into the physical therapy office and usually get more challenging exercises. And they're also usually prescribed a home exercise program. So on off days, they usually do easier exercise or the same exercises. So generally speaking, they're doing work six to seven days per week, right? My general recommendation is to perform two to four pressing exercises and two to four rowing exercises three times per week, right? And on the off days, I like to do the rotator cuff work. So picking somewhere between three and four different rotator cuff exercises and doing those on off days from your pressing and rowing. 
So you got your intermediate exercise, your patient went through the beginner, the intermediate, they're starting to progress, they're still not back to Olympic lifts, what are the next steps? Well, I have a video for you, I'm gonna leave a link in the corner, it goes over my favorite advanced exercises for folks that have shoulder pain that wanna get back to Olympic lifts. So clean and jerk, snatch, all that good stuff. Go ahead and click on that link in the corner and I'll see you there.